Welcome to week three. Uh, this week, you should be finishing off lab two by tonight, in theory. Uh, realistically, if you're having a problem, I'll probably forgive you if you show up at the beginning of a, lab, of a lab and you ask the question. That's okay. Uh, as a reminder, you should be um, finish working on your hybrids. Right now, you should be dealing with the hybrid two or three. Uh, you do get two attempts. It keeps the best score of the two. Therefore, it's worth doing them because they're worth 10% of your grade, I think. Therefore, they're not there for shits and giggles. They're there because you need the points. All right, so this week, the topic this week is I've got three topics. I'm hoping to at least get through two. The third one can be pushed to next week. If I can get all three in, that's fantastic. That means next week's lecture is going to be significantly less boring. And what the heck? Okay, that was exciting. I am not seeing the study show on my screen. All right, we're talking about data normalization. Uh, data normalization is actually one of the harder database topics. Um, it's full of definitions, it's full of things you're supposed to do or not do. However, it is uh, unfortunately something that's necessary. And data normalization is a tool. It's a tool set. Its purpose is to allow you to uh, validate and improve the design of a database so that it serves as basically so it matches up certain constraints so that you don't mess up your data. And essentially what's going to happen is you're going to decompose relations, as in remember last week when we were drawing the boxes and the relations were kind of chunky? This is the process of breaking down those relations in such a way that each of the relations are broken down to the smallest component pieces that can be maintained well. Now, well-structured relations. The meaning of that is it's a structure that contains the minimal amount of data redundancy. In other words, each database object contains the minimum slash maximum required to do a specific task. In other words, if you are tracking countries, you only have the information you need about the country in it, not maybe the regional divisions, such as provinces or states. Um, what happens is, if it's normalized properly, it allows users to insert, delete, or update rows when you're adding data to the database or modifying the contents of the database without causing data inconsistencies. Uh, data inconsistencies are the bane of the application developer. When the database is badly designed, you end up having to write all this extra code to avoid some of these problems. And older systems, such as older banking systems, are full of these holes. And they've written the, the applications around all these holes so that it's been dumbed down for the average teller. I'm just picking on you. Um, now, the goal is to avoid anomalies. And there's three kinds of anomalies. There's the insertion anomaly. An insertion anomaly is when you add a new row of data and it forces you to create duplicated data. And in a minute, I'll have some stuff on the screen to discuss these different issues. There's deletion anomaly. If you delete a row of data and you lose um, data that might be needed for something else in the future. In other words, you delete a chunk of data and it takes other stuff with it for the ride. That's bad. Um, and modification means if you change one row of data, you end up having to change many rows of data to accomplish the same goal. Uh, an example of that that I can usually use is an order status. Order status shipped. And we have a status called shipped. And we have hundreds, if not thousands, of order lines in our system. And we're actually containing the word shipped as a value. However, if we end up having to change the word shipped for some other reason, if you, they choose, they say, that's not well, it's supposed to be called shipped, we're going to call it dispatched. 
Instead of updating one value in one place to from shipped to dispatch, you end up updating maybe 10,000 rows of data. And in older systems, what would happen is, okay, how many of you probably have seen 2001, the movie? Okay. Anybody seen the older videos? We know when the computers are using tape to tape drives. Tapes are rolling, tapes are rolling. And what would happen is if you needed to update, this is one of the reasons they created uh, databases this way, is what would happen is it would seek down the tape, find the value, rewrite the value, roll down the tape some more, find the value, rewrite the value 10,000 times. Every once in a while that tape would break. Now most of you probably are old, old enough to remember VHS tapes. And uh, some of you probably remember your VHS eating your VHS tape just before you have to go return it. And the tape would get all crinkled and damaged and the data was damaged because you'd watch the video and be all scrambled for a couple of seconds, right? Imagine what happens to computer data if it gets eaten. So the goal of this process was to avoid unnecessary trips up and down the tape. Or back in the days when hard drives were really, really slow, like a five megabyte hard drive was the size of this table, and this disk spun, I think, at 500 RPM, which was, you know, insanely fast for the time, but by today's standards, you know. So what would happen is the seek times are so slow, the updates would take forever. So if you normalize your data properly, your seek times would be smaller and you'd be modifying less stuff. Okay, so this is a relation. So in other words, picture we had a box on the screen or a box on the board that said employee. And on this, we had the following pieces of information. Employee ID, name, department, salary, course title, and date completed. Now, the question they asked on the screen, of course, they even put the answer on this slide. This isn't one of my slides, this is somebody else's slide. Is this a relation? Yes, because there's, no, there's unique rows and there's no multi-valued attributes. In a moment, we'll discuss what multi-valued attributes are. And what's the primary key in this case? It would be the employee ID and the course title. Why? Because those two combined are unique. Ooh, that's going to be nice. So if you look at here, <laughs> right there, you can see that the employee ID is repeated for some people several times. Um, their names are repeated, their departments are repeated, their salaries are repeated, but the course title, so if you do the employee and the course title combined, that's a compound primary key. And that is the primary key. So those are the pieces that identify the, the records uniquely. Now, sometimes I wish I could project both screens at the same time with different content, but I can't. Okay. The anomalies in this table, you cannot enter a new employee without having the employee take a class. Let's take a look at that again. If this is part of the primary key, you can't add an employee without providing a course. And the way they've set this up is that even if I could add just an employee, but they can't have an empty course because there's already a value in here of empty. That means that it's already in use. The other catch is, you well basically put, you can't add an employee without the course, otherwise you don't have all the bits and pieces that are required for the primary key. Uh, deletion. So, for this one case, if we nuke employee 140, right here. Employee 140 only took one course. And if we look at the course title, tax accounting, you can see it's not repeated anywhere in here. So if we delete this row, we lose the fact that tax accounting was ever a course that was offered, which is bad, because we're losing data. And in the future, we might want to know who took tax accounting, but we can't, because tax accounting is no longer a value in the database. That's a deletion anomaly. And an update anomaly would be, let's say for Margaret Simpson, she gets a raise, another two grand a year. We'd have to update two rows to show her salary. And if we use the case from before where we seek the first record and then the tape breaks and then they re-splice the tape, which they used to do, um, 
what would happen is one record would be at 50,000 and one record would be at 48,000. Done. Now there's inconsistencies in the data because the update failed. It's even in modern systems that use, don't use transactions, that can happen. If you're updating, you know, 10,000 rows and the server explodes halfway through and only half the rows were updated, ta-da, data's out of, sequ out of sequence. And it's out of date, it's inconsistent. The goal is we want to avoid that. All right, so here are the steps of normalization. Oh, by the way, this slideshow is up on Blackboard. So under course, documents, presentations, week three. Um, we start with a table of multi-valued attributes. We remove the multi-valued attributes. And actually in about two or three slides, I've got some examples of that process. Then you go to the first normal form, remove partial dependencies. Second normal form is remove transitive dependencies. Third normal form is removing uh, result, uh, the anomalies resulting uh, from multiple candidate keys. I'll explain that, what that is in a bit. And then there's voice COD, uh, which is removing multi-valued dependencies. And we stop there. Um, even as it is, voice COD is, is known in the wild as normal form three and a half. Um, essentially, um, Boyce and Cod, those are two different uh, professors at some university somewhere, that realized that there was something between third and fourth normal form <coughs> where there was edge cases that fourth normal form did not resolve, but they needed to be resolved. So they invented a new normal form and shoved it in the middle, which is why it became known as normal form three and a half. But officially it's called Boyce Cod. Most, when you hear the phrase, the database is normalized, most people refer to the third normal form. That's what the red text there is referring to. I'd say 90% of the time, third normal form is enough. The last 10% of the time, I'd say, say the last 9.5% of the time, boys cod is enough. Fourth and fifth, and there's actually sixth and a couple of others past that. Um, those actually are used like half a percent of the time. It's a rarity that you need them. It's usually when you inherit really old data that's when you have these problems that use weird data formats. Or you are going to university and they decide you need to know it. Somebody laughed. I'm serious. Uh, fifth normal form is actually known as being an academic normal form. So is the sixth normal form and whatever the heck it's called after that. Okay. For functional dependencies, this is an important phrase. These two phrases are, there's two definitions here, and they're important to understand. Functional dependency. A functional dependency is the value of one attribute determines the value of another attribute. That means that a key of one determines the value of another. In other words, it's like there's a record embedded inside a record. Um, actually, the slow, the, the um, table I'm going to have up, up, I think, in one more slide after this one it has, I can't, I can only see one slide ahead. Um, but two slides basically from here, I think, if I got a table that shows multiple value dependencies and functional dependencies. Um, in other words, the attribute, one attribute determines the value of another. For example, actually, this is not a really good example, but it's a simple example. You store a person's date of birth and you also store their age. Their age is dependent on their date of birth. Technically, it's supposed to be a derived value, but I'm just going to use that as an example. There's actually more to it than that. And the other one's a candidate, the phrase is candidate key. A candidate key is a unique identifier. Remember last week and the week before when I discussed primary keys? Well, before something becomes a primary key, it might be a candidate key. Those are pieces of information that could be used to uniquely identify the data, data in the database. And essentially, each non-key field must be dependent on every candidate key. So remember earlier I was saying it's all definitions? Yeah, that's a lot of definitions. So for example, if we use the SIN number, a person's social insurance number, as your candidate key, Every other piece of information that defines a person must be dependent on the social insurance number. 
That means that your name is dependent on your, SS, your, your SIN number. Your last name is dependent on your SIN number. Your date of birth is dependent on the SIN number. Your address shouldn't be dependent on your SIN number technically because your address may change. That's the difference between a functionally dependent and non-functionally dependent. Your phone number should not be, is not dependent on your SIN number because it can change. And you can actually have more than one phone number. Therefore, they're not functionally dependent on that unless you decide it is. Database design is all about deciding what's important what's not. All right. So the definition of the first normal form. And the, the rules are there are no multi-valued attributes. Every attribute is atomic. That means every attribute is self-contained and has a value. And now, this piece of data is not an official relation and it's not in first normal form. Why? We got chunks of data missing in here. Um, and if you look at the address, we have some multi-valued attributes in here. There's two values in this field. Uh, theoretically, you could store it as is, but there's multi-valued attributes in here. As it stands, there's no way to retrieve this row or this row. Um, of course, they decide to keep the address as one complete piece, which I don't agree with. But in the example, if the, for the previous one, they filled in all the blanks. Now, this is technically in first normal form, but it's horrible. It's not normalized. But you are able to retrieve any given value if you know the order ID and the product ID. Between the two, you're able to retrieve any of this. However, there's a ton of anomalies in it. If, shoot, I almost started writing on the whiteboard, I mean on the screen. I don't know if this is going to work. Okay, it's magic. We can write on it now. Okay, so for example, we want to delete a record. And if we delete certain records, um, for example, we want to nuke this one, this row. Let me just go grab another marker so I can highlight that specific row. Okay, this row we're playing with. What happens if we delete it. We have an, a deletion anomaly. What's the problem? What are we going to lose? Well, no, that's no. We're not. We we still have this information repeated, but we're going to lose a specific piece of data. Uh, I think I think you beat by ten seconds. No. Nope. Well, yes and no. Yes. Yeah, so we're losing. Yeah, we're losing two pieces of data. You're both correct. We lose those two pieces of information. And while we're at it, at it, we're also going to lose the price and the description. So if we lose, delete this row, we no longer have a record that we ever sold at Cherry Writer's Desk for 325 bucks. Gone. Um, that's the deletion anomaly. If I, let's say I want to update some data, and I'm going to do an update anomaly instead. I want to change the price of the entertainment center. What happens? I need to change the price in two places, which means we actually updating records in two different orders just because I want to change the price of one product. That's the update anomaly. And since our primary keys, I'm going to use blue. 
since right now our primary keys is a compound key, can we actually add a new customer <coughs> without adding a product? We can't. Our insertion anomaly is that we have to include a customer and a product for every line. And that's the three kinds of anomalies that you find in there. I'm going to just bring the screen back down. All right, I actually went over the, the, sec the, the, the next slide using my marker. Now, second normal form. And second normal form, and this applies to all the normal forms, it's a bit like Dragon Ball Z. You can't become a Super Saiyan unless you're a Saiyan to start with, right? And you can't go blue unless you're yellow, right? That's the right order. Anyways, I've, I can't stand it, so I never watched it. I just use that as an example because there's enough people in the class that usually get the joke. So to be in second normal form, you must be in first normal form. Otherwise, you can never be in second normal form. It's like saying you can't be in T119 unless you're in T building. So now, the next rule is every non-key attribute is fully functional dependent on the entire primary key. All right. That means that every non-key attribute must be defined by the entire key, not only part of the key. That means there's no partial dependencies. Which brings us to this slide with all kinds of arrows. But here's how the definite dependencies work out. Because that's the way it is right now. It's in first normal form, but it's not in second normal form because things aren't dependent properly. On the order ID, order ID, the full dependency is the order date, the customer ID, customer name, and address. This is a full dependency. Like these are completely dependent on that. Because when you looked at that table earlier, you could actually cut it right down the middle. The customer ID here this one and this one, the name and the address are part of the, de are dependent on the customer ID. That's known as a transitive dependency. In other words, this is determined by this, this is determined by this. So in other words, we've got dependencies inside of dependencies. Um, the product ID, you've got the description, the finish, the product, standard price, and the ordered quantity. Those are full dependencies on product ID. The partial dependency is the description, the finish, and the price are partly dependent on this. The ordered quantity, if you go order ID plus product ID, gives us the quantity ordered. Yes? These three fields are dependent only on the product ID. That's why it's partial. Order date, customer ID, name, and address is a partial dependency of order ID. We can actually track this information without any product information. That's why they're partial dependencies. The or quantity ordered is fully dependent on the product ID and the order ID, you cannot have ordered quantity without those two. That's why it's fully dependent. So we end up with these bits and pieces. Make sure you send me those, eh? Uh, 
Um, for now, sure, we can go with that as our answer. Uh, but essentially, it's a partial dependency because it's only dependent on this piece. If we were suddenly to break this right down the middle, we'd still be able to manage that data. If we were to break it down the middle, we could still manage that data. That's why it's partially dependent. Because this is only dependent on this piece, so it's only partially dependent on the primary key. Whereas the ordered quantity is dependent on both halves of the primary key. And the transitive stuff we'll talk about after. That's third. That's what we want to do with it. <laughs> Make sure you send me that question. Okay. So what we had before was this big long line of data. Now what we've got is this nice tidy set of tables. We went from one big relation into three smaller relations. Order ID, product ID gives me order quantity. That's the third normal form. Product ID, description, finish, and standard price those are fully dependent on product ID, so this one's in third normal form. These two, we, we skipped the step for these two. They went straight to third normal form. The last one, on the other hand, we have order ID, order date, customer ID, customer name, and customer address. That one's in second normal form because it's breaking a rule of the third, which we will be getting to. But what we have achieved is we've gotten rid of the partial dependencies. In other words, we have three relations where we can now go change the name of a customer without touching the order quantity. Or we can change the finish of a product without changing a, without possibly touching the record of a customer's name. So this is in second normal form. And then what we want to do is get rid of the transitive dependencies, which is which brings me to third normal form. I gotta find a way to make the transitions on my camera a little smoother because it's a little jumpy. Third normal form. It's in you got it, second normal form, plus there are no transitive dependencies. If we remember just before, the customer ID, name, and address are dependent on the order ID because that's how the table was designed. That's a transitive dependency. In other words, we can't change a customer's name without potentially touching the order date. Or we can't change their address without possibly touching the order date, which is bad because we're touching things we shouldn't be touching unnecessarily. Okay. Uh, in other words, a transitive dependency is data that's functionally dependent on something that's not the primary key. It's a partial key or, you know, it could become a primary key, but it's not. But that data is only dependent on that key, that Subkey. Let's call it a subkey for the time being. Um, so it's called transitive because the primary key is a determinant for another attribute, which in turn is determinant for a third. The order ID determines the customer ID, which then determines the customer's name. You shouldn't have determines determines twice in the same sentence. It should be the customer's name is determined by the customer ID. The order date is determined by the order ID. End of story. So what you do is you take the transitive dependencies, strip them out in another table, and we end up with four tables. So earlier, we had order ID, order date, customer ID, name, and address all in one table. What we've done is we split that table. But you notice we kept customer ID in both places. The customer ID is a determinant, in other words, it's the primary key of name and address. Up here we've got customer ID, but can somebody tell me why it's still there? Yes, it's to link the two tables, which is, if we go back to our terminology, this is a primary key, therefore this is a foreign key. This primary key determines the value of this foreign key. However, 
now we can change the customer's name without worrying about the address, the orders they've had, or we can change the order date, or if we had more fields in here, the order status, without risking touching the customer's information. And right here, it's really small. That's why it's good that you can get the slideshow on Blackboard. You can see the ERD that basically it becomes. A customer places an order. The order includes this order line. This product is also ordered on this order line on this order line. This should kind of look familiar to last week's lab. Yes, well this primary key becomes a foreign key in the other table. So a customer ID here becomes the foreign key of customer ID in order. The order ID becomes a foreign key in order lines. Product ID becomes a foreign key in order lines. And if we take order ID and product ID combined, it, get the, it becomes a compound primary key so that we can retrieve the ordered quantities of any given product. So the cool part is we can now change the price or the description of a product without ever touching orders that exist. It's broken down into the smallest component pieces that make sense. And because it's broken down in the smallest component pieces, we can actually update information here without affecting anything else. We can add a new customer without having to have an order. We can create a new product without having to add a new order. In theory, we could delete a customer. Let's say we added a customer to the database and it's like one of those customers who comes in spends an hour and a half at the front desk and decides not to order anything and then they walk out. At the end of the month, some companies will prune the dead records. So they'll look, see if any customers that don't have orders and just prune them out of the system or archive them. Um, yeah, that's the pruning process. Yes? Why do we need the order line? So we know that customer ordered a cherry desk and he bought two of them. Which are the, the other lab, yeah? Yes. Yes. They were not by themselves an entity. That's doing design based on a real world document which is different than maybe they gave you a data dump file for this instead. Um, technically, that would have been the same, but the, this place, they do work for specific things, and if they replace the left ball joint, can you replace the left ball joint twice? That's why there's no quantities. Can, should you change the oil more than once on a car? No. So each item can only go on the invoice once. And that's why it was designed the way it was designed. This is a different case where you could buy two desks or buy two tables or buy five chairs. And on your order, it'll show that you bought five chairs. This structure allows that. The other structure does not. Well, we could if we wanted to. We just add a quantity field. Yes. Yeah, essentially we can change the customer information without affecting any other tables of data. Um, this is just like if you order something from Amazon. You order stuff from Amazon and you can order three of one thing, two of another. And if they decide to suddenly uh, change the description of the product, it shouldn't affect what you've ordered. Because they can change the description without affecting what you ordered. That's what the structure is. That's all there is to it. The example I had you guys do in lab was designed to keep it simple. We don't have to worry about quantities and all that kind of thing. There's, there are you know, pros and cons. We can make it more complicated, less complicated. OK. Did that pretty much answer the question? I think, maybe. OK. Actually, we're doing good time today. Okay, 
voice code normal form. I actually stripped out two slides out of this uh, because I'm more worried about the definition than the actual process. If you can get your relations to third normal form, I'm normally happy. But voice code normal form is if you have a relation that has more than one candidate key. In other words, we have a relation where they have a, a SIN number and a passport number, for example. And there can both be candidate keys. How do you decide how to resolve that issue? There's a few different ways you can do it. You can break, it, break down the data in multiple ways, or you can use something called a synthetic key, that kind of stuff. Um, is in other words, the, de the official definition of voice COD, or BCNF, is if and only if every determinant in the relationship is a candidate key. In other words, if you have the passport number and the SIN number as candidate keys, all the data must depend on both of those. In other words, if you want to put a person's name in the database, you have to have their passport number and their SIN number. That's voice code. Which leads me to how you resolve voice COD. And there's two ways of resolving it. Like I said, you can break it down to smaller pieces, but it still gets kind of messy. Or you can stop using natural keys. And what a natural key is, is it's a key of something that exists out there. Your SID number exists. Your passport number exists. Your visa number exists. Um, those are things that exist. Your name exists, your gender exists, whatever. That's all stuff that exists. Those are natural possible keys. What you end up doing is instead you use synthetic keys. Now, synthetic keys are, there's pros and cons. Now, I'm going to get some definitions out of the way. A composite key. I've used this phrase a few times. A composite key is a key that's composed of two or more attributes. In other words, before, if I go back, down there, you can see that the order line has the order ID and the product ID. That's a composite key. You cannot enter an, order, an ordered quantity unless you've got both those values to put in with it. That's a composite key. A natural key, actually I just finished defining it. A natural key is something that exists out in the world. It's a real world thing, SSN, SIN numbers, that kind of stuff. A synthetic key, also known as a surrogate key. So those two words mean the same thing. Surrogate key or synthetic key, they're synonyms of each other. It's a key that has no business meaning. In other words, it's a wholly manufactured value. It has nothing to do with your SIN number. It has nothing to do with your name. It has nothing to do with your phone number. It's, a th it's just a unique identifier. Depending on the database server, it could be a number, it could be a string, it could be any number of things. It's just a value. Uh, odds are your suit number is a synthetic key. Uh, no, the synthetic key comes from a, program, a programmatic source. So in other words, the business administrators never care what the surrogate key is. Sometimes they're, they're exposed, such as your student number or um, invoice numbers or receipt numbers. Those are exposed synthetic keys because they're made up. They just happen to apply that meaning to them as opposed to being completely isolated within itself. Is that cover Okay. Well, she brought up student number, for example, as an example of a synthetic key. It's a, well, it is exposed. A non-exposed one would be if you had a database record such as um, let's say you've got a system that allows you to have multiple addresses registered against you 
For example, Amazon. You know how you can have two, three, ten different shipping addresses registered against your account? You never actually see address number 1,255 and 36. You just see 123 some street. It has a unique identifier behind the scenes that you never see. But that's a synthetic key that's completely hidden, has no business meaning, other than it uniquely identifies one piece of data, or one set of data. The end user does not see it unless it's been given business meaning, such as a student number or an invoice number. And a lot of systems, <clears throat> a lot of systems, actual fact, the invoice number doesn't match the synthetic key. They actually use a different number for the invoice number so you can hide the connections between things. Well, it's not random. Well, it can be, but it's usually not random, but it's determined either by the database or by the application. Uh, depending how the system was written, the application could determine the, the synthetic key, which I don't trust the application developer, so I always say get the database server to determine it because uh, it's designed to do it. Instead of, if, for example, you get the application to determine the synthetic key, what it's got to do is it's got to reach in, say, what's the biggest synthetic key you've got? Thank you. Well, now we're going to add one to it. In the meantime, somebody else might have just reached in there and asked the same question, and then you'd have collision, which is bad, because you can't have collision. Because primary keys are unique. Like every special snowflake, they're all different. And therefore, you tend to get the database server to take care of it. Um, the primary key is the preferred key for an entity type. In other words, what is the attribute we're going to use to find a unique piece of information. Foreign key, which we described earlier, is it's basically the attribute in an entity that gets its value from the primary key of somewhere else, essentially. All right. Uh, yes, it, the one key is not unique enough, so you need two fields to make it unique. Yeah, but for example, you, you're, let's say you have a Canadian SIN number, the person next to you has an American SSN, and they happen to be the same number. After you've stripped out all the special characters, you've got the same number. Therefore, it's not unique enough. You cannot guarantee it's going to be unique. And it's possible that your SIN number can change. If your identity gets stolen, you have to get a new SIN number. Yeah, that's composite key at that point. Then you have to have add a third field to make it unique. And it gets complicated, which is why we use synthetic keys. Now, I'm going to list off the issues with natural keys. As you can see, there's a nice long list of problems with natural keys. Number one, the size of the primary key. <coughs> Surrogate keys slash synthetic keys don't have a problem with index size. Now, I'm t I discuss indexes later, but indexes are another structure in the database that helps you get at the data faster. Problem is that for every record you add, it's got to add something to the index. And most surrogate keys use numbers, and numbers are easy to index. Whereas if you're using an alphanumeric field, or you're using a combination of fields, the size of each piece of information in the index gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which makes the index bigger, which makes the index slower, which makes everything that has to do with the index slower. Um, foreign key size, same problem as issue number one. If the primary key is big, the foreign keys are going to be big too. The problem is then is that if you've got a primary key that's big and a foreign key that's big in the same record, your indexes are going to get bigger and bigger, uh, geometrically bigger. It's not going to be a this bigger, it's going to be a you know, significantly faster uptick. 
because the data just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Number three, aesthetics. And as it says on here, it's an eye of the beholder kind of thing. But I can guarantee if you're using numeric keys there's a, and you're only dealing with one field, as in a single surrogate key, your code will be cleaner, simpler, and faster. Why? You don't have to sit there and try to grab values of three columns. You grab the values for one column. And instead of being the primary key being, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, combined with one, two, three, five, 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 one, two, one, two, plus, say, Daniel and Goudreau, that's my primary key. That's huge to search on as opposed to 53. Aesthetically, 53 is prettier in the code. It's an aesthetics thing, but if you've dealt with programmers, as long as I have, and they have to deal with a compound key, they're going to complain. They say, it's not pretty. It's not elegant. Fine, it's not. Uh, that's not always a good reason to use a synthetic key, but, you know, it's a good reason. Cons number four and five. Optionality and applicability. Sword keys have no problems with people or things not wanting to provide all the information. Going back to the example of a database that requires the passport number and a Canadian SIN number. Okay. If you're not a Canadian citizen, you're not going to have the SIN number. Therefore, if you're using that as part of your primary key, guess what's not going to work? You can't add the person in. But if you're using a surrogate key, well, they could have a passport number, but not a SIN number. Or they could have a SIN number without the passport number. Why? Because they're being tracked by a separate number. In other words, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah, 7. I think I, think I double-counted someone there for a second. For example, I want to change your first name to something else. I can just go update, whatever your first name is, I don't know your name, to Bob, where ID is equal to 2. Bang. Update ID 2 to have a SID number of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Bang. As opposed to, I need to find update Bob to have a passport number, but he never had one before. I can't do that. But because the fields are not optional, like he could actually be sitting there with a SIN number but not a passport number, and that's completely valid. Con number six, uniqueness. Surrogate keys are guaranteed to be 100% unique. And that's a relief. Because as we were using the example before, Canadian SIN numbers are nine digits long. I don't remember what American SSN numbers are, but I think if I remember it, they're nine digits long. Nine and nine. British, uh, what the heck is it called? PIN numbers, I think they're called. Or PAN numbers, I don't remember exactly what they're called. They're nine digits long. What are the odds that they, they know there's an overlap between the UK, Canada, and the US? Yeah. Actually, not even that because SIN numbers are the last digit's a checksum. And so same thing with the American SIN number in the British, whatever that gets called in, in England. And so that means that you actually got eight. But they actually the only combination of eight because you got to add up a certain way for them to work. Therefore, there's actually a very limited subset of SIN numbers. And same thing with SSN numbers or whatever. So there's always a good chance of collision. Uh, if you use a surrogate key, the odds of collision are zero unless something has gone wrong in your database. That's why they're called synthetic. Okay. Privacy. You're number two. I'm identifying you by number two. Is there anything in there that identifies you personally when I say, hey, number two? Yeah, but is there, do I know, can I, am I listing out your SIN number? No, for example, imagine every time somebody came to the bank, and they had to give you their SID number for you to access their banking information. Right? They weren't using their bank card. They, they go, give me your SID number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now you heard a SID number. The person next to them has heard the SID number. The person behind them heard their SID number. You know, that's bad. As opposed to swipe your card. Which actually all that's doing is reading 
the unique number on the card because every card number is unique. And actually, in the banking system, that's not your that's not a, the synthetic key. It's linked to something else. But they're using that as a unique identifier for you. Um, because the banking system existed before bank cards existed. <laughs> so, you know, they had the passbooks. Then you had one per account. Um, but using that as an example, the when I say, hey, number two, I'm not exposing anything unique about you. There's nothing personal. There's nothing that they can use to identify you otherwise because it's completely private because it's unique to you and only you, but they don't know anything else associated to it. That's why it's good for privacy. Uh, accidental denormalization. So somewhere along the way, we, we've been logging SIN numbers as our primary key, and we suddenly expand to the US, and we throw in SSN numbers into the same field. And third guy in has a duplicate. We suddenly denormalize the data because we're applying different meanings to the same information. Either we have to add a new column to track American SIN numbers or SSN numbers, which anybody who's dealt with data systems bigger than, you know, for five people, doesn't happen. You don't add new columns because bad th things break. Um, so when you're using ID, hey, number two, you can't denormalize number two because as I go through, you know, one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 and I get to the back, it's 80, 89, you know, 73, blah, blah, blah. Each body person here is a unique number. And I add another person in. Who cares what I'm putting into the SIN field? Because that's not how I'm picking up, picking you up. I'm picking you up by a number. Two. That's what you get for sitting in the front row. <laughs> you get picked on the whole time. You're convenient. Okay. Um, Cascading updates. Uh, those are scary. So, for example, let's say we're using the SIN number. Back to the SIN number as our primary key. And the primary key on the customer table is their SIN number. And then on the order table, the foreign key is their SIN number. Their SIN number is propagated to two different places. Now, you, you did a stupid, and you typed in your bank card number into a web page that looked a lot like your Scotiabank web page. And you punch in your password, and the next day your account's been cleaned out. And suddenly they've got more information that they ever needed to be able to fake you. Because, you know, based on other information, they usually most people use the same password for 90% of their stuff. And they were able to figure out that you had a Gmail account. And then they went to your Gmail, and then they saw that you have a revenue tax return. And then they got some more information from that, and after about a couple of hours of crawling, they are you. Um, and basically put, you need a new SIN number because your old SIN number is compromised. It's no good anymore. Now what happens is I have to update my primary key in my customer's table and it cascades down to the orders table and I got to update in both places and I got to do it all in one go. Why? Because they are related on each other. If I change this one, all these records are now invalid. But I can't change these ones. Why? Because they're not over here. So you have this weird cascading effect where uh, chicken before the egg, right? I can't update this unless I update this, but I can't update this because this is there. So you end up with this endless loop and it's a bad thing. Uh, natural keys have that problem. Um, and some people like using var cars. These are kind of data type, which I think I'm talking about next week. Uh, the data types. Usually, for synthetic keys, you use numbers like integers. Um, integers are fast. Database servers love integers because they're numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's quick, easy to find. Now, imagine instead of that, we're using some 32 character string. So I, they talk about join speeds, and I really that's something for later in the term. But when you connect data from more than one source, you're doing something called a join. And it's a lot faster to say, hey, all the things that belong to number two report, as opposed to everything that's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, 25, 36, 5, please report. 
Believe it or not, the database server actually almost uh, does exactly that inside itself. How much longer did that take than, say, hey, number two? Now, I'm really being facetious and really simplifying what actually happens, but that's part of the effect is it takes, because it's got to scan so much more data. Like, for example, if that big long string I gave, if the last digit was different, it's not a match, but it's actually got to match all the digits for every single row. Therefore, it takes a long time to compare 32 characters as opposed to a number. Because databases and computers do numbers really well. That's just all they do is numbers. The rest of it's just, you know, magic. Okay. Disadvantages of synthetic keys. Now, these four points are things I've heard over the years. They're going, oh, it's a problem getting the next value. There's a censored word on the screen. Uh, the word's bullshit. <laughs> oh my, he said a bad word. So that being said, earlier, remember I used the example of if it's the application that controls the next value, it's got to ask the database server, what is the next value? Database server comes back with the value and somebody else reaches in to grab the next value. I'd say 99% of database servers out there, I'm leaving off 1% because I'm sure there's one out there to prove me wrong, support auto increment. Auto increment means it's running with a little clicker. And different servers do it differently. MySQL my and Microsoft SQL server have a column type called, one's called identity, the other one's a type called auto increment. What does it do? You insert a record without the primary key, it gives it a value automatically. If the next value is 25, guess what? It gets 25, the next one gets 26, 27, 28. Other database servers like Oracle, Postgres, which is the one we're using, uh, and, and uh, IBM's, it's called DB2, and a few of the others, use what's something called sequences. And it's even closer to the clicky thing. Um, did you ever see the people sitting on the side of the road with their, under their parasols counting the cars going by? Did you ever wonder what they were doing? That's what they're doing. They're counting cars. They're actually counting kinds of cars, brands of cars. And they're going click, 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 click. And basically they've got a little clicker that counts the next value. Every time they press that button, they can't go back. So the way it works in, say, Postgres or Oracle is the application will say, what is the next available value? That database server goes, click, 55. Guess what can happen next? 55 never comes back out of it because the second you've asked for the value, it's moved up by one. 55 is no longer available. Bang, 56, 57, 58. Um, there's ways to actually make it even more automatic than that, but that's you know roughly what it's doing. It's click, 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 click. Okay, they say users don't understand synthetic keys. Who cares? And users shouldn't be messing with them anyways. For example, you're a number two. Can you imagine if you referred to every customer came to the tail by their number? Hey, 55, how are you doing today? <laughs> that would go well, right? They put in their bank card, they pull it out, and you know their name because it's up on the screen, or it usually should be anyways. Um, or as I was doing the Amazon example, imagine if you had to go and find your shipping address based on the magic number. Oh, your only address, 32 billion and change. You've got to type in those numbers every time you want to change your address. End users should never deal with them. They're set automatically. They don't get to play with them. That's not an excuse. Okay, extra joins. Sometimes. But that's really not an issue. I mean, you're dealing with numbers. Database servers do numbers fast. It's not an issue. Extra indexes. Now, if you have end indexes per table in the natural key world, in other words, if we're using natural keys, you'll have n plus one if you're doing synthetic keys. And that's you know, this is the only one that's kind of valid. Of all the complaints people have about surrogate or synthetic keys, this is the only one that's valid. 
And by valid, I mean I don't care. So for example, we want, if our normal table, if we're using the SIN number as our primary key, we'll have an index on the SIN number, maybe an index on your phone number, maybe an index on your email address so we can find you by email address quickly. So we have three index. We're going to add a surrogate key to the front of that. Suddenly we have four indexes. Why? Because we've got to index the primary key because primary keys are always indexed. End of story, do not pass go, that's just how it is. You don't even get to say no, no index, because the data server creates it for you. The second you make something a primary key, there is an index. End of story. It's magical, it's instant, and it's, you know, you can't argue with it. Um, so that's the only valid argument against synthetic keys. Um, they solve way more problems than they cause. As we can see, they actually causes one tiny little problem. It solves tons of big problems. So if we were going to go back to this, and we're dealing with this thing right here, where we have a compound key. <coughs> now, Let's just say the customer was ordering product five and he wanted three of them. He also ordered product four and he wanted two of them. But suddenly he wanted to order another product five but for some reason he had a different option on it. As it stands right now, we can't have say order 15 with product five twice. If we had a synthetic key on it, we could put product five in there as many times as we want. Why? Because you can. Because there's something else tracking it. So for example, if we had order ID, product ID, and order notes, and they were ordering <coughs> a cherry desk, and they just want the standard cherry desk, cherry desk goes in, everything's good and happy, and they're happy with it. Great. Then they say, I want a second cherry desk, but on cherry desk number two, I want the brass handles instead of the black handles, for whatever reason. With this design, you can't do that. If you had a synthetic key to uniquely identify it, you could actually have product ID in number five a second time on the same order and have a notes field which allows us to add extra notes. The joy of the synthetic key. Okay. So that was the end of the synthetic key business. That's the end of the normalization. Um, and it is. Oh, damn, I've got time to finish it. Okay, the next one is actually very short. There's only five slides. And as you can see, there's not a lot of text on these slides. It's design concepts. I'm going to talk about the design process. And I've got a couple of extra points on here that sort of apply but they don't. Um, but I'm going to specifically talk about the design process. Okay, the design process. Now at this point, you know we, how we did our little um, conceptual diagram. We created a logical diagram. There's actually a process in all of this. And it's actually similar to the application development life cycle. Um, which I don't know if they cover that in your first level or not. Uh, but when you develop software, there's a certain cycle that happens. And database design is similar to that. It's an iterative process. It means you do all the steps more than once. You, you keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it until it's good enough. Which leads me to point number two. There is no perfect database design. There is no such thing. If you reach for perfection, your database design is going to get so complicated that it'll be totally unusable. Essentially, you want to reach a point where it's good enough. And it's good enough that you didn't write yourself into a corner, or you didn't design yourself into a corner. For example, writing yourself into a corner, George R.R. R. Martin, right? In the novels, do you ever notice how there was like a, what is it, a seven-year gap? 
Because he wrote himself into a corner. He killed too many characters. No spoilers, because everybody knows he kills everyone. But he wrote himself into a corner where he had nowhere left to go with the story because, you know, I th- what was it, 80% of the main characters were all dead? So what do you do at that point? You invent new characters. Same thing with database design. You can get yourself to the point where it's so complicated that nobody will use it. Why? Because it's so complicated. And then you're stuck in a corner, you can't get out of it, and you're doomed. So the design process is made up of four steps. And then there's an end process review. Step one, identification. Now, there's two sources of data out there. Path number one, you're recreating something that exists. This is also known as reverse engineering, which is a bad word in IT. Uh, People do not like it when you reverse engineer their stuff. Uh, You're allowed to recreate it, but you're not allowed to reverse engineer it. Uh, Where I work, if you use the phrase reverse engineer in front of a customer, you owe donuts for a week. We punish people that use the word reverse engineer. But we reverse engineer crap all the time. (laughs) I probably owe donuts after that. But we figure out other people's file formats. And how can you figure out somebody's file format? By reverse engineering how it's put together. You can't recreate a file format if you don't know what's inside. And you figure out how to get inside of it. Um, So that's path number one. Path number two is the clean room implementation. The clean room implementation is, of the two, my preferred approach. I hate dealing with other people's crap. It's challenging because you're stuck with their information. And you've got to always include everything they've had plus anything else they want to add to it. The clean room implementation is... For example, the CEO of the company goes missing for two weeks, comes back after being on a vision quest and says, Dan, I got a new product. Whip me up a database. (sighs) Okay, we can do that. (laughs) And uh, at that point, we're working with a vacuum of information. But what's the good thing about a vacuum of information is you're not dealing with legacy. But there's two things that are common between both of them. Number one, you try to identify all the gross data objects, also known as entities. Customers, users, orders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you try to list all the objects and categorize them. By listing the objects, that's also known as a conceptual diagram. We use the conceptual diagram to identify all the big chunks. Step number two, after we've created our big, which is a bit like when I was describing the process of creating the conceptual on the board, the design process is the same. After you've identified all your objects, also known as entities, you're going to add all the basic fields to it. The primary key, the descriptor field, name, address, phone number, all that fun stuff. And you try to identify as many bits and pieces of data as you can right off the bat. It's okay if you add too much. That's part of the normalization process where you get rid of stuff and you break stuff up. But you try to identify as much of it as you can on your first pass. Then after you've identified everything, you give them data types. Your name is a character field. Your date of birth is a date field. You know, stuff like that. Um, You just give it valid number. You give it data types. You guys have started programming? ish you've learned about what a variable is and a variable must have a data type in java right databases fields have to have data types too the data types are similar but they're not the same uh obviously they're both going into a computer so they got to have something in common right but they're not quite the same the rules are different um but you have to assign data type to each of the fields so that's when you get to the point where you're getting to the physical side of the design process in actual fact, if we were going to point this out, that would be logical, I mean uh, conceptual, logical, physical. Okay, you also want to define your relationships. You want to make sure all your objects are connected. And you want to identify which one are the parents and which one are the children. 
which if we use the terminology from we've learned so far, it's a participation in the cardinality. You find out which ones are mandatory, right? There's the cardinality again. Your foreign keys as needed. That means you're now modifying the logical diagram or the physical diagram to make sure that all the foreign keys are present. Then you normalize, because now you've got a data structure and you start breaking it down. And we've already seen the, the normalization side, so I don't need to go into detail. Uh, you're going to create reference tables as needed. Uh, I haven't really described what reference tables were, except I think in about 10 seconds on the first lecture. Um, I'm actually going to cover those in detail next week. But you're going to create reference tables as needed. These are tables that contain static values, like lists, countries, states, titles, genders, because uh, there's more than two. Um, you create, you replace fields in the standard table with foreign keys. Sometimes you will design, you'll realize, oh, this really should be a foreign key to this table. You, you replace the bits and pieces. The goal is you want to reach their normal form. So you've got your database design normalized. It looks good, fantastic. We look happy with it, which leads us to step five. You review the design for potential issues. Normally, you don't do it the second you're finished. Anybody here ever do any creative writing? Right, okay, me too. Years ago, I got published once. I got paid about a buck fifty. They paid per word, and it was like two cents a word. So I got paid nothing after they took their, their chunks out of it. So I got a little check in the mail for a buck fifty. It was amazing. Then my mother threw up my only copy. <laughs> when I went away to college, she cleaned my room. I was sad. Um, but that having been said, you know, you don't. If you do any kind of creative writing or create, creating anything, okay, fine. Apparently, only one creative writer. Anybody here, you know, do digital artwork? Not taking pictures, but actually altering the pictures, creating designs, logos, that kind of stuff. The rule is, after you've made a design, you step away from it because you don't. Because it looks great in the moment doesn't mean it's great. It just means it was great while your brain was on it. And you tend to want to take a break, take a walk, walk the dog, walk the cat, or the cat walks you, or the cat eats you, uh, as applicable. And Or you go have a beer, go out to supper, whatever. You give it a day. Then you look back at it and you realize it's complete crap. Great. You go back to step one and do it again, taking what you've learned in the process and applying it better. You also try to find someone to review your work. Now, those of us that have done creative writing have often handed off copies to people say, what's this story like? And they go, what is wrong with you? Like, really? Tentacle space aliens? No, I'm kidding. I never wrote stuff like that. But, you know, like, really, what is wrong with you? Then you know they'll review it. But the database process is more along the lines of they'll look at your design and they'll say, what is wrong with you? I kid you not. I've actually heard those words. And they'll look at it going, why are you doing this? This makes absolutely no sense. You've done this 10 times before and you've never done it like this. Why would you do it this time? If somebody can review it and give you constructive feedback, fantastic. So once you find all the weaknesses, go back to step one and apply the changes again. Fix up your design as much as you can. Again, take a break, give it to someone else to review, on and on. After a while, the list of changes gets smaller and smaller and smaller to where the guy will come back to you and go, ah, it's good enough. I'm tired of seeing it and I don't see anything really wrong with it. Congratulations, you're sort of finished. Then, you take a review and you look at it and go, did I write myself into a corner? Did I design myself into oblivion? Will I ever be able to expand this system or am I stuck? So the goal you want to achieve is, is it good enough? But will I be able to add anything to it later without having to do major restructuring? And, I mean, here's the, you know, a real anecdote that happened to me. 
when I used to work for digital, and most of you probably don't know who digital, who digital was, uh, digital became Compaq. That name might ring a bell. HP merged. Okay, I worked for all three of them at the same time. I was there for both mergers. Then I found a new job really fast because it wasn't looking good. But when I started working at, at HP, I was really new. I'll be completely honest. I'd only been out in the industry for about a year and a half. And they threw a piece of crap database at me that somebody in there had no engineering pro concepts put together. And they said, can you make this go on the web? And we're talking web circa 1999. So, you know, it was web 1999 was a rough place. It was hard to make things happen. And I was an idiot. Where I had apparently had not listened well enough in my desk system design classes. And I created generated synthetic keys that got unwieldy and were impossible to use. And they were huge. Like we're talking, like 36 characters long, huge. And it got to the point where they needed, oh, we need to add a sub-object of this. Now, the way the key worked originally, I thought it was really smart, okay? I thought it was really, really smart. The way it set up the keys, was something like this. Okay, it was a call tracking system. So we track customers called in. It was for a specific subset of people. So it wasn't using the big one they want. Their big call tracking system, they wanted one unique for these guys for some unknown reason. So you had a customer. The customer was assigned a three-digit code. I'm like, how many customers do you guys have right now? 12. These are like corporate contracts. It was a new division. And I said, 12. Well, if I go with alphanumeric, you know, I can put in here all the way up to, you know, technically Z, Z, Z of values, right? Zero to Z, zero to Z in each one. That's tons of room. Yeah, there's tons of room. Now, they start, they open a case. And I said, well, how many cases on average do these guys have? They said, well, on average, that we've seen they have on average about, you know, 2,000 cases. I said, I'll be smart. Obviously, I wasn't. I'll allocate that much room for case numbers. Case numbers were numeric. In actual fact, there's actually one more layer in here, actually. Okay, that was the customer. That was the contact. That was the case number. Then we had case notes. I said, what are the odds that somebody will get up to nine case notes? Okay, that was the primary key for one of the tables, was that long, programmatically generated every time. It sucked. But I didn't know what I was doing back then. I was new. Uh, I learned a lot of important lessons on this one. Because just before I left, and I'm so glad because I didn't have to do it, they said they wanted a subnote. Yeah, uh, those were the notes for the uh, man, the case managers. So they could actually copy on each of the people's notes during. Uh, well, those that have worked in a call, anybody here ever work in a call center? Hot damn! You know when your supervisor is listening in on your call. And he's tracking the notes you type in. Well, they had a note review system where they could add their notes to your notes. <laughs> That's what this was for. Yeah, be thankful. Um, as you can see, <coughs> when I needed to index the smallest object, I was talking about 3, 7, 12, 16, 
20 characters every time. Whereas if I was using numbers, this all the, instead of being a 20 character thing, it could have been like that. Why? Because not every case note would get a thing, therefore there wouldn't be so many of these. It wouldn't run out of room. Considering if I look at the one for Postgres, if I remember right, the biggest index number can be, uh, I think it's a 14 digit number, 15 digit number. Well, actually more than that. But it's a really big freaking number. Uh, we're talking in the quadrillions or more, uh, depending how you set up your database. So that's, that's my anecdote about synthetic keys and doing them wrong. Uh, just use numbers. Because if I'd had, because I had nobody else to review my design. So, you know, it's like one of those things like, this is a great idea, I'm going to run with this design. I didn't take the time to take a break. I didn't get somebody to look at it. And I didn't look at it the day after. I said, this is my design and I'm happy with it. And I never reviewed it again. And that's what you get. Uh, if you don't do step number five. No, these are all separate tables, but I was actually creating the primary key as being a compound of its parent keys plus some other magic numbers. So the further down you go, the bigger the primary key was getting. Yeah, it was a huge... Yes. <coughs> but actually, the, the design process behind it was kind of cool because when the customer called in, they had a... Uh, each one had a unique... Uh, end user had a unique number assigned to them. And what was their unique number? Was this. So they could punch in that number into the system. So I took a synthetic key and gave it real world value, which was not what you're supposed to do. Right? So now that was 20 years, uh, 18 years ago. Right? So I've had a few years of experience since about what you don't do. Um, so the customers could use this number and it would get them to the point where they could start a case number really fast right after because they could punch in this number to find them. Uh, how many times do you think the end user actually had that number at hand? Never happened. Not once. It was a great scheme that went nowhere. Uh, that's how it was. Okay. Now, that was the last slide. Cool. This week's labs is a normalization lab. Um, you read the instructions and you do it. <laughs> but it's not like the diagramming one. It's to going through the steps of breaking down the different relations and what you need to do. Actually, I'll pull it up so I can discuss it. That way, if somebody doesn't feel like coming in, they don't need to come in because they'll have the explanation. Um, technically, tonight. Um, but the first couple of labs, I tend to get let go a little bit because people are still wrapping their brains around all the words. Because there's so many words, so many new words. And we lost it. What the heck? Where'd you go? Let's try that again. Okay. Essentially, as a short version of this, you were given three existing pieces of information. And you need to break down this information into uh, a properly diagrammed that design. Um, so again, I want two diagrams, sort of like what you did last week, a conceptual and a logical. I haven't done the physical stuff yet, therefore that's, you know, I don't care about the physical ones. Essentially what you're going to do is you're going to look at these three pieces of information and you're going to normalize it into break it down its component pieces. Just like in the slideshow where we took that big long order line thing, 
and broke it down into four tables, you'll do the same thing. You'll deconstruct all the bits and pieces. Now, up to five is you're going to break this down. You're going to create a design in ERD+. Plus. That should be an updatable database. By that sense, I mean it should be a database where there are no insert, update, or delete anomalies. So there, you, if you follow the rules of normalization, there shouldn't be any anomalies. And then there's step number six. <coughs> a lot of people don't, they see that, they go, oh, step five, I'm done, and they don't read step six. You, uh, uh, step six, you add another table to assign members to a class. In other words, you're going to take your first design, and you're going to go, oh, I'm happy with this. And then you're going to add a table to it and break it again and fix it. That's the goal of this. So in the end, you're going to give me two diagrams, one conceptual, one logical. Because, you know, you've, you've experienced it when you convert the conceptual to the logical. Sometimes things don't look right. And why do they not look right? Is because you did something wrong on the concept side. And, yeah, there's, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head how many tables come out of it. But there's... Um, If I remember, it's about half a dozen tables, six tables, seven tables or so to get right. And uh, that's going to be this week's lab. Uh, I don't normally do the lab preview at the lecture, but this one here required a little explanation. Um, but yeah, that's what you guys are working on this week. Don't forget to do your hybrids. And uh, that, oh, question. Um, Oh. Okay. Currently, they're unlimited. It's only supposed to be two, and that's my fault. I forgot to change the setting. Normally, what happens is after the test that applies to those hybrids has been done, I make it unlimited so you can study. So you can keep trying and trying and trying and trying. I'm not going to nail you on it because as, as I realized, as you just said that, I'm going, I didn't pay attention to my settings on each of those hybrids. Um... Uh, not the first four. Too late now. Uh, some people have already done all first four, <laughs> so I'm not going to take it away from you. Uh, it's still going to only keep the best grade uh, that you've achieved, so, you know, that's that. Uh, the other ones after, the next batch, will only be two tries until, for, until you're done. Uh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. <laughs>